So as a, as a person who, who, uh, who's, I, I, you know, a straddler, because I, you know, start, I come to this as a rare disease person, you know, I, as, as some of you know, and then I become a pharmacogeneticist, and then I become a uh, sort of a, a, a hanger-on in the GWAS community, let me just put it that way. So uh, I, I think that uh, that's a really nice uh, way of thinking about boundaries, which is what this panel is supposed to be about. And I have lots of thoughts about boundaries, but, but here's one that I don't think we've talked about very much, and, and I, I don't want to belabor it again. And, and that's the boundary between clinical research and patient care. Uh, one of the appeals of, of working in the electronic medical record as a research environment is that it blurs that boundary. And, uh, and, and we've talked about, for example, deploying whole genomes or pieces of whole genomes into the electronic record as a, as a tool for clinical care. And I think we have to recognize that we, we open a whole Pandora's box when we do that. And those are research questions. And I don't want to draw a boundary between research and clinical care, but I think we are in a new era. So, Pearl's last slide with the with the with the with the with the sort of uh, the circle. The circle. I'm not, I'm not sure by the circle. I'm not sure how I would redraw it, but but when you're taking care of a patient, you're taking care of a patient at the clinical level, and you're taking care of a patient who may also be a research subject at the same time, and you may be blurring those 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 boundaries. So I I, I think that that's not a wine. Uh, that's a great opportunity, and the opportunity really is provided to us by the development of sophisticated electronic medical records and other very, very high-dimensional data, and it's beyond any human being's ability to handle that uh, without the ability, without, without the help of a, of a sophisticated uh, computer support system. So, so I think that we're at, at a place where straddlers are really important. I agree with that. I think we're at a place where some of the boundaries get blurred, and that's a good thing. Uh, we do need to train people, and I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, we, I don't see very many clinical geneticists on the wards, so who are the, who are the models for the internal medicine folks? I don't know about pediatrics. And, uh, and, and I'll, I'll leave you with the thought that I, I can't believe they pay me to come to work every day. It's a really exciting time despite all the sort of doom and gloom that you hear about it. And so I think this is an opportunity to really uh, to, to change the way medicine is practiced, and uh, I'll leave it at that. I have to say just one word in defense of my circle. Um, <laughs> number one, not a lot of thought went into it. Um, secondly, <laughs> the only thing I really wanted to point out was I think we too often talk about going from research into clinical care. And I just wanted the, we really have to set up our clinical care system that can act as a resource for future research. So you could fill in that circle and then make everybody happy. Back and forth, exactly, exactly. Now you like the circle, huh? Yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> Pearl, I have a question for you over here. Oh. <laughs> um, when this point has come up uh, in other uh, settings, uh, and I don't ask that you represent the entire bioethics slash LC slash IRB community, oh, but I will you. say uh -huh. when it comes up, there are a number of people whose hair catches on fire if you were to put that little diagram up with the two arrows on it, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they start going on about the therapeutic misconception and that there needs to be firewalls between clinical care and clinical research. and. So I wonder, number one, um, how you read that, the larger situation of that um, setting. And then number two, is this question of the boundary between clinical care and research on the agenda for the advance notice of proposed rulemaking? And can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, to your second, I would say no. I, I really don't think the advance notice addresses this in a yeah, it might be snippets, but I really don't see it um, there. Certainly not the research into clinical care issue. I do not see that. I mean, it's too bad. It's, it would be a, would have been a great opportunity. In terms of is this on the radar screen? Absolutely. The four days prior to this, I was at the Primer meeting, which is Public Responsibility to Medicine Research, kind of the sort of trade organization for IRBs and IACUCs and all that. Um, which gets 2,500 people, and I would say 20% of the topics were genetics or genetic related. And a lot of it is how do you get consent, what do you do with the data, 
we all realize the electronic medical record is becoming very uh, kind of users of, for everyone. So yes, it is on the agenda. I don't think anyone knows what to do with it. And I do think in terms of people's hair going on fire, there is the huge concern of therapeutic misconception. But I think there's different kinds of research. I mean, and I think while, I, I agree, I think we really need to merge as much as possible. There still is the issue, if you're in a therapeutic clinical trial, I am, I am making my decisions about you per protocol, not because of the specific things that you're coming in to me for. And I think that is a huge difference between true clinical care versus research. I think, so there are types of research that I think we have to absolutely protect that. I think as we merge data, I think we do have to protect the stuff that really doesn't have any utility. But it's important for someone taking care of that person, maybe for a, uh, you know some other medical problem, just to realize that person actually is in a research study and you know maybe is getting a research drug. There's so many issues, and I think that interface has become so difficult. Um, again, we're, looking, we're using 1970s regulations. Uh, and I almost think we need very different regulations for different kinds of research. And I think genetics is pushing it almost because of volume. I think, so I think this is actually an opportunity. I mean, I, don't, you know, I try to just do the extremes here. I think most of us live in the middle. Um, but we've got to find some way of making that middle definable so that my middle is at least you know, sort of like yours so we can communicate. And I think that discussion is starting to happen at not this year's Primer meeting, but last year's Primer meeting. Uh, there was a panel that I actually happened to participate in that talked actually about you know, the use of electronic health records and how that you know, is going to really push together both the two-way right. uh, communication between research and clinical education. And uh, for at least, there were about 200 people in the audience, I think, for that primer session, one of the well-attended ones, and there was universal agreement that's a topic that primer needs to mm -hmm. spend a lot more time discussing. Yeah, we actually we also had a, a great debate between Jim Evans and Robert Green on whether or not actionability is a criterion to use. So I mean, we're mirroring some of the same discussions here, but to a very different group. So I think that's good. That's good. Pearl, Paul, Paul I agree with you that I think okay, most. Okay, thank you very much. Most people. Next. <laughs> exactly. I'll stop there. No. Um, so you know, most people when asked about use of their genomic information in research do ultimately say it's okay. I think. Certainly, publications from Amy McGuire and Wiley Burke established right. that people want to be asked, even though it's okay. And I think that gets to the problem with the newborn screening blood spot cards with regard to lawsuits in Texas and Minnesota, um, in, in that people wanted to be asked. So the storage of newborn screening blood spot cards, at least in Texas, had been going on for many years right. and was actually codified in state law and in Department of State Health Services rules, and the procedure for which the research, or the procedures under which the research was done in Texas followed federal regulations and again, department rules. So I, th I think that in moving forward with genomics research, I think we just need to be very mindful and very careful that even when we're following federal regulations, that that doesn't preclude people from getting angry or right. filing lawsuits or you know staging a social media revolution with regard to this Partic particularly i think in this era of waxing and waning distrust of government um, mm -hmm. you know it is i don't know if i can say this in an hgri sponsored thing but um, you know i think that this is something that you know and we we saw this in texas but it's i think it is generalizable in that this is something that politicians can make a lot of hay over, right? right? That they can look very good by saying, you know, your government is like taking your genetic information and I'm gonna introduce a law that's gonna stop that. Um, so I, I think that it, it, we as a community just need to be very careful moving forward about engaging the public and not just saying, well, hey, like I followed the you know, right. letter of the OHRP rule. Like yeah, I think you're absolutely right in terms of people want to be asked and then asked or if I had the world, I would notify. This is what we do and this is why we do it. Um, but then you immediately get the problem of those people want to opt out and how do you handle that? And in our systems, you know, we can't, it's hard to deliver on opting out throughout the entire, you know, system. But anyway. Well, I'll tell you that that's what the state law in Texas that was, <laughs> so in order for them to drop the lawsuit, because again, the 
the, our state lawyers felt like this was absolutely something that they were not going to win in court, even though, you know, again, there was nothing that they could point to that was illegal or didn't right. follow federal regulations. And so, uh, I mean, I think that we had we were forced to implement and opt out. So yeah. everybody who gets a newborn screen in Texas now gets a piece of paper about, you know, and they have to be talked to about opting out. And it is costing a huge amount of money just for the personnel to process, the, even though it's a s tiny fraction. The fact that we have 400,000 live births in Texas every year means that, you know, the personnel and the money to kind of go through those, pull the cards, destroy them, and send a letter back saying, yeah, we destroyed your blood spot card is right. not insignificant. And the last thing I'll say is how much we talk about consents, opting out, et cetera. You know, two days after it happens, people can't remember they signed anything, let alone what it said. So, Yeah, I think uh, there's another um, bit, that, and maybe this is just obvious for, uh, uh, for everyone here, but, the, the, you know, one of the issues relating to blurring is that um, in clinical care, you can really do anything you want. Um, and this is most frequently um, uh, in the situation of uh, off-label use of drugs. I mean, Pearl and I both trained as pediatricians. Everything we prescribe is on off-label use of drugs. The studies haven't been done, and yet it's accepted clinical care. Uh, the point that I'm making is, is that we shouldn't necessarily hold what we're doing to an extraordinarily high standard compared to everything else that occurs in, in the clinical care environment. We meet, need to be cognizant of it, we need to be thoughtful, but we shouldn't necessarily, again, create such an exceptional environment that in the long run it's going to prevent smart people from doing innovative things with uh, information that ultimately advances knowledge. And we've seen that repeatedly in the um, you know, novel use of uh, agents that are out there uh, through off-label. With regard to the um, patients just want to be asked paper, I wouldn't want to criticize a paper that I'm actually a co-author on, but I would just like to point out one limitation, which is that um, we, you know, these were focus groups and very educated patients. Um, and, you know, to me, part of the message was they actually don't care what we do, it, but they appreciated being asked. But I, I'm not sure that they speak for everyone. I will say I reconsented a couple cohorts now and um, for you know, one cohort, which was very largely middle to lower class, um, the, every single person who sent back the, the reconsent, uh, save one, said that they wanted re results returned and they, wanted, they were per perfectly happy with dbGaP, but a significant fraction of them did not want newsletters. You know, Interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. bother. Don't bother with me. The uh, the one other point that I just wanted to add to your uh, important discussion of the common rule proposed changes is that one of the changes is not just that tissues are identifiable, but that yeah. genetics data is identifiable, which means that everything in dbGaP is identifiable. Right. And so that's a very, very important change. And so for the people who didn't respond to that on the first round, if you want to respond on the second round, um, that's something that will really make all these kinds of databases that we really need and are talking about, you know, impossible as far yeah, as Yeah, thanks for see. clarifying that because they don't exactly say tissues identifiable. It says tissues identifiable because it has DNA that is identifiable. You know, that's their roundabout sentence on that. I actually wanted to touch on that issue a little more. Um, so our hospital lawyers um, have taken the opinion that DNA sequence is identifiable information. And therefore, because we're a HIPAA-covered entity, it comes under a HIPAA rule, so DNA sequence. And while in some ways that might not sound like a big deal, what it means is that all of the computers that you use for sequencing, all of the computers that you use for processing the data, the systems you use for reporting it, I mean, ignoring being able to share it beyond your institution, all of those systems have to be certified HIPAA compliant which is not a trivial undertaking for a right. genome sequencing analysis pipeline, which is what we've had to do. Um, and, and so, I, 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 and the redundancy backup, so mm -hmm. you know, HIPAA systems mm -hmm. have to be redundant. So these things that might seem like a small thing actually turn out to be really big deals. So as a clinical lab, we are under those rules already. Wow. 
but it, it does also have implications for data sharing. <clears throat> But as a clinical lab, we can share with other clinical labs, providing we have the appropriate right. signatures. But, but, but I think really as a community, we really have to think about this implication of DNA sequence, whether it really is identifiable information or not. Yeah. I mean, we, we've, we've had that conversation luckily come out on the side of no. We appreciate the problem, but not at this time. I'm told I'm last, but I'm, so I'm not going to talk about hospital lawyers, which I find almost an oxymoron. But. Um, it, 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 the, the, the anecdote you described seems to me sort of a, a microcosm of a much bigger problem, and that is this business of you know, varying standards of whatever you want across the country, whether it's a hospital lawyer talking about DNA or whether it's an IRB that, dis, you know, your IRB decides this, but IR, our IRB decides that. It's not like one group is more ethical than the other, but it seems it, that is a big barrier to, uh, to moving forward. And I'll just leave it at that. 